Hello, everybody. My name is Liz Voda, and I'm going to welcome you to this session of Getting the Most Out of Your Library After Graduation Edition. So today we're going to talk about um, what access our alums have to library resources, both through the Francis Wilson Thompson Library as well as libraries in general. Just kind of explore what's available to you. Um, so Again, we're going to go, we're going to start with, you know, what access you have to the Olmstead Library, and then we're going to kind of branch out, as I said, and talk about other public universities, public libraries, um, the state libraries, and then finally kind of touch on open access a little bit, uh, just to give you an idea about what access you do have to some of the resources that you've kind of been using um, for during your academic career here, but also might need to in your professional careers. So, with the Young Flint Library, um, you can borrow physical materials if if you buy a borrower's card, okay? Um, so for $25 a year, you could borrow just from the University of Michigan Flint Library. Um, if you want to up that to $120 per year, this will get you um, access to both Flint and Ann Arbor materials. We actually send you to Ann Arbor to um, basically buy a borrower's card through them. Um, but neither of these cards uh, give you access to interlibrary loans. So you can't request things from other libraries with the um, alumni or community borrowers cards. Um, and it also doesn't allow access to any of our online resources. Um, so if you do need to access any of the online resources that we have, you can actually just come into campus um, and, you know, either log into an ITS computer if you still have your uh account active, which you should. ITS does allow you to keep um, your like your email and some login stuff after you graduate. Um, but it's just like to get onto the computers. It's not to actually like get things off campus. Um, and or if you actually bring in your own machine, um, like so you bring in your own laptop, as long as you log into the university Wi-Fi network, MGUEST is what you'd be using, possibly EduRoom depends. Um, you could access all of our online content, right? You just have to be um, on a on an on a campus IP address, basically. Um, and this is actually fairly standard um, practice when it comes to academic libraries. Most vendors uh, that we have agreements with will have something like this um, for all of their clients, not just us. And we do have a frequently asked question um, about this on the libraries page here. And so, you know, not affiliated with UM Flint, and it talks about, you know, the different areas of access that you have, including some of the agreements that we have with other libraries and other institutions. So if you are working, at, like, say, at the Mott Foundation, or if you are um, a grad student at, like, MSU or Wayne State or something like that, we do have some um, reciprocal borrowing privileges with other colleges. Um, but for the general, like, alumni, you get a job, you're not really associated with anybody, again, there's a little bit of pay for physical materials. Um, and if you come to campus, that's the only way you're gonna be able to get uh, online access. All right. So as I mentioned, public a lot of public universities will have similar policies to us. So if you are moving closer to another public university, so say you're moving down to Detroit and you're gonna be out near Wayne State, you're out at GVSU, um, if you're up in the UP, maybe near Marquette or uh, Lake State, um, even SBSU, CMU, things like that. Or if you're moving out of state, you know, check uh, their websites, basically. Um, typically, these policies are going to be found under something like borrowing or maybe lease services. And you're definitely going to want to look for information that's labeled for guests or for visitors. So let's like, take a look at a couple of examples here. We're going to start with uh, MSU and we'll look at Wayne State and then GVSU. So on the MSU Libraries uh, page here, if you go up to Find and Borrow, um, there is the Circulating and Borrowing option here. And this is where you're going to find information about, you know, visiting scholar MSU visitor privileges, right? Um, or under community borrower privileges, right? So there's going to be information like this that talks about, you know, the different uh, policies that this institution has. So this is what you're going to be kind of looking for. Similarly, at Wayne State, if you go to um, under services, borrowing and renewing, um, they should be able to tell you about guests and alumni down here, um, what they would be able to uh, 
you know, if there's any fee-based things for, you know, community borrowers, co- corporate borrowers, what happens when you get, you know, a, um, a library card through them. Okay. Uh, GVSU is a little bit different, uh, mainly just because, uh, they have, they're not as open as other people. So again, like look for resources for services for alumni and visitors. And this is the kind of thing that you might see. So again, library guest access form, alumni library access barring from the GVSU guest library use. These are all the things that you, you should be looking for on whatever institution you're nearest to page. Okay. Um, Public libraries, I'm going to plug. There is a lot of uh, databases that public libraries will subscribe to. A lot of them are going to be geared towards genealogical research, um, also just kind of basic skill buildup. So like language learning, job and career training, um, business help, sometimes a lot of homework help for our K through 12 people. Um, a lot of people are in Michigan, we have the Michigan Electronic Library, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. But a lot of our a lot of the libraries will like kind of have access to databases through Mel and places to look on their websites or anything like under research or learn. Sometimes they'll call them databases, but a lot of the time it's definitely going to be more that research or learn um, kind of language. So let's take a look at our two um, nearest public library systems. So Flint Public Library. Um, Again, under research and learn, it talks about, you know, um, autos and DOI, business, job and career. You can also pull up all research. Um, same thing with online learning, like learning a language, computer skills, this kind of thing, uh, local history, genealogy. And if you go to, say, all research, um, you'll be able to kind of see everything that they have. Some of these are actually databases. Some of them are just um, websites like BookRite, for example, is a book blog that comes up quite a bit. Um, but things that like the public library has kind of chosen. And a lot of the time you'll even be able to limit to uh, the database type. So for example, if you wanted to look for just genealogy databases, uh, you would be able to do that and find some of those things that um, either databases or sites that they're suggesting that you look for um, through that as well. Genesee District Library, really specific really similar, um, learn library databases, for example, and you could see either databases by category or an A to Z list. Um, and again, you'll see that it's, again, very geared towards kind of um, more general information, not necessarily scholarly in the, for the most part. There is a little bit of that, like under history and culture, for example, there might be some stuff there. Um, but again, it's very much geared towards kind of general information. And if you are not, you know, sticking around in Genesee County, please explore, you know, the what your local library has to offer because there's a lot of great stuff out there that is not just, you know, book clubs and story times. There's a lot of amazing programming that our uh, public libraries do. So always support the public libraries. Um, in Michigan, we are actually really privileged in a lot of senses because the Michigan Le Electronic Library, which is run through the State uh, Library of Michigan, um, is basically statewide access to select databases from vendors, mostly EBSCO, few through Gale, um, for both popular and scholarly content. There's a lot of things for K through 12, but there, in, again, there are things that are more um, scholarly in nature. Um, the other thing that the Michigan Electronic Library does is uh, runs Melcat, which is a central catalog for um, of like books for participating libraries basically so not all libraries in Michigan are part of this but a lot of them do I think there's it says over 400 actually I don't remember the exact number but it's definitely over 400 libraries academic public school there's even a couple of uh, like specials so they're like attached to a museum or even a corporate library possibly um and if you use interlibrary loan through our library it's really similar to that basically um it is only for physical items though um, and we'll take a look at both like what the databases that Mel has to offer as well as, you know, kind of how, what, how to find those participating uh, libraries um, for MelCat. So the e-resources here um, is just mel.org and, you know, click on e-resources and then you can look for um, public libraries, things that are more geared towards kind of reading, um, things that are more geared or more suitable for kids or students. And then, or you could browse everything and you already see like academic search complete. That is, you know, an EBSCO product that kind of pulls in a lot of academic content. Um, 
And it's literally just a ton of different things like agricola is agriculture, alternative health watch, art and architecture sources. So there is definitely a um more scholarly bent to some of this stuff, but it, there is again things that are a little bit more practical, like the auto repair source, um, some of the business books and the career exploration things that you're seeing in here. So things to think about. Um, then the Melcat for go back here. Um, where to go? You could log into my Melcat, um, but really you kind of a lot of and you'd actually you can search from it just directly from mel.org. Um, to find your participating libraries, though, um, there is a list on Mel's site here, um, and you basically can go down and look to see which, you know, your which li public libraries in the area, and which academic libraries, all these th things are here. Um, I will say that Genesee District is a member, but Flint is not. Let me, pardon me while I scroll down here to the F and G section. Yeah, so Flint Public Library does not participate in MELCAT, um, but Genesee District does see they're listed right here, okay? So again, if you're ever curious, you know, even just ask your librarian at your public library, or you can hop on to MEL's site and see um, if your library is a participate is a participating. Okay. So the Library of Michigan is actually another really good resource to look at. It is really heavily based on genealogical legal information, a lot of government information. They have a huge law library. Um, and a lot of Michigan specific kind of information and uh, especially with like historical newspapers and that kind of thing. There are some academic databases. Um, in order to get access to any of this, um, again, uh, you actually have to have an online card with the Michigan, actually let me go back here, with <clears throat> the MEL databases, as long as your IP range is somewhere based physically in Michigan, you do not actually have to log in to um, these databases. You should just be able to go in because it's all kind of based on the IP ranges um, in the state. With the Michigan Electronic Library or the Michigan li or Library me, with the Library of Michigan, excuse me, um, you are actually going to have to apply for a card, and you can do so online. Um, but that will only access your online resources. If you want to physically check out anything and physically request stuff from the Library of Michigan, you will need to go and apply for a card in person and get a physical card. Uh, but just to give you some an idea of some of the online databases and resources that um, they have, you have things that are, you know, again, newspaper, family history oriented, um, again, from all over the state uh, in a lot of senses. Um, but then down under other subscriptions, you do see some things that are coming back from ProQuest and not EBSCO. So definitely different things. And again, the Michigan Electronic Library is run through the Library of Michigan. So it's kind of like a subset of databases that they have that, again, are freely available to anybody in Michigan. And you do not have to have a library card in order to access them. So if you are in an unincorporated area and you do not have a public library, you could go in to get some of these uh, to get some of these resources as well. OK. Um, then the last thing we're going to talk about just in general is open access. So open access publications are there's a there's a couple of various ways that you can think about them, but a, a basic definition is that they um, are free to use. They are immediately accessible online that you don't have to log in to get them. You don't have to create an account to get them at all. Um, and there, a lot of it is basically research um, publications and data. That's where, at least from the academic standpoint, that we're coming from. Um, and often they will be licensed and kind of published uh, or published under licenses that allow for greater reuse and redistribution. Now, some organizations like the Creative Commons, which is one of the big licensors of open um, access materials, will push for more and more access so that you can do almost anything you want, right? As long as you give credit to someone or you could even say, hey, I don't want this. I'm just going to go. It's a completely free license. Other times it's like if you reuse this, you have to and create something new with it or like um, you're going to have to use a similar license which Creative Commons is a great site. They do a really good job of kind of explaining the different licenses. Um, but in any case, open access is definitely a larger kind of growing movement. I will say that the cost of publishing is often kind of put on the author rather than the reader. So 
with a subscription service, you know, you're paying, you're helping to pay for that, you're paying for that content. Whereas in an open access, oftentimes the cost of publishing is kind of pushed onto the author. Um, I will, and again, it is a growing movement. There's a lot of mandates coming out from um, like the, U the US government actually that any research that's being done with uh, funds and grants from the government need to have data that is openly accessible or have some sort of kind of like push, like you can, you know, have um, a publication under, uh, behind a paywall for a few years, but eventually it will be open access. Um, and a lot of the, the academic journals are either partially open access at, the, at this point. So if the author pays that little bit of extra money, um, their article would then be open access, but still published in that main journal. Um, other journals, especially newer ones, are completely open access. So, for example, the Public Library of Science (PLOS), uh, all that's all that is open access. There's a growing movement with academics um, because of the way that academic research is being published, and it's it's a it's really expensive for a lot of the subscriptions that we have. So, OA is one thing to go um, to kind of combat this a little bit. The Directory of Open Access Journals and Directory of Open Access Books, so DOAJ and DOAB, these are probably the biggest kind of search engines for scholarly materials across the different publishers. Um, and just to give you an idea of what these look like, um, so oops, sorry, DOAJ, um, you can actually search for journals in, all, in a multitude of fields. Um, you can go by, you know, publish or subject, look for a, a specific um, uh, number for them. You can look for articles. I will say I'm not a huge fan of the search function in for articles. It's not very robust. Like the, the filters aren't there. There's not the best advanced search in my opinion, um, but this is one place to go for it. Um, and then the directory of open access books, very, really similarly, these are going to be coming from academic peer reviewed books. Um, will these items come up in things like Google Scholar? Will they come up in um, just general searches? Yes. Um, Google Scholar does not have a good filter to say, I only want open access items and to go that way. Um, so uh, through the library, one of my colleagues has kind of put together this open access resources guide um, that talks about finding things a couple of different ways. We also have a list of open access resources through our A to Z list. Um, it is definitely not complete. There's a lot of extra stuff on there or extra stuff outside of that list, I should say. Um, and we're probably... Um, that list is ever changing. So we might take some stuff off if it's not getting used a lot or we might put stuff back on. Um, and I will say that some of the things that are on this A to Z list aren't actually, in my opinion, open access. They are just, you know, available, but the kind of um, licensing that truly makes something open access and reusable in that Creative Commons license sense is not, sense is not always there. So that's kind of the um, landscape of academic research after graduation. Um, if you have any questions, please pop those in the chat. I'm watching that. Um, or if you have any questions for me, here's my contact information. Um, I will say that uh, a lot of you, if you're going to like a research lab or to a company, they might have subscriptions of two different databases that you would be able to access through that company, through that hospital, um, especially with hospitals, check to see if you have a health librarian that's, you know, attached to your health, to the hospital setting. But if you do not have that kind of access um, through your company or whatever, again, please come in and see us, uh, you know, hop onto our Wi-Fi, check out your local public libraries, check out your local public universities, and, you know, uh, there is there is extra help out there after graduation as well. All right, not seeing anything, so thank you very much for watching. Thank you for watching this recorded webinar. Find upcoming webinars to register for at libcal.umflint.edu.